Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, and I'm starting to see a lot of familiar faces, and that's really great for me. So I came here to Los Angeles, I mean, back to Los Angeles, I should say, after spending about a dozen years in the San Francisco Bay Area. So that, that particular geography is, is, has my heart, but I'm starting to open it up to Los Angeles. So again, happy to be here. Uh, I am based at the Williams Institute. How many folks in this room are familiar with the Williams Institute? Woo, so wonderful. Um, so the Institute does, uh, conducts research, essentially, that focuses on issues concerning LGBT communities. And one of the really exciting things about the Institute is a colleague that I work with, her name is Jody Herman, who does a lot of the research uh, focused on transgender communities. And with her leadership, the Institute has been able to do a lot more, I think, in, in the world of research um, that, uh, that focuses on the trans community. So with that said, I'm gonna make clear, come out of the closet, if you will. Um, I am an attorney, don't hold it against me. Um, my focus is not solely on tr the trans community, but it is on those individuals that are impacted by HIV. And when we talk about trans communities and HIV, I think I want to say we almost always assume that by saying that um, we're clear, but I don't think we are. So when we say, when we talk about the trans community and HIV, um, one of the underlying assumptions is trans women. So I want to be clear that when I'm talking about our research today, um, some research that we did here in LA County, I'm talking about transgender women. What we don't know with regard to HIV and transgender communities is the plight or the situation with regard to trans men. And that's something having to do with the lack of data collection and our way of really categorizing what do we mean when we say MSM. So um, that's another kind of piece of disclosure. I just want to note that before I begin. So I want to start with the notion of health equity. Um, if it, this gets boring at any point in time, feel free to start like a wave or something just to notify me that this is not working for you because I am following a really dynamic speaker um, and so I wanna make sure that this stays interesting. So health equity, what does that mean? It means the highest level of health for all people. So you might have heard these terms a lot, um, the difference between equity and equality. I think it's something that um, those in the advocacy community have talked about a lot. Equity is about making sure all people have that highest level of health. So in that consideration is looking at what is historical and contemporary injustice. And I think everyone in the room is pretty much aware of injustice. It's the reason why we're here, I think. It's the reason why we do the work that we do. So health equity. The first task in addressing health equity is actually addressing health disparities. Disparities are Typical are types of health differences that are linked to certain, uh, to certain things. So here, uh, the definition from Healthy People 2020 says social, economic, and or environmental disadvantage. Who in the house is a public health scholar and or someone that prides himself on looking at health disparities as a public health and Science. Okay, so those of you that are out there, um, I just want to ask for your forgiveness. I am a lawyer talking about public health. And, um, and, and the reason why I, I'm going to talk about it is because I have really, really grown to see how the public health language and the public health framework is really helpful when it comes to looking at these issues. So when I say that, I say issues, all right? All of us in the room are individuals. We know what it's like to live through life. We know what it's like to face our challenges on an individual level. But when it comes to looking at an issue like health disparities, something so broad, sometimes I find that I'm a little bit kind of frozen. You know, I, I feel despair, I feel sadness, I feel overwhelmed. And so when I look to a framework like the public health frameworks, or the framework I'm gonna show you today, the reason why I look to them is because I'm looking for a way out of that feeling. I'm looking for a way out of feeling hopeless and helpless and finding a way to other solutions, okay? So 
in the public health sector, often talk about social determinants of health. These are things that are going around, that are swimming around you in your life and, and everybody else's life, right? They include things like socioeconomic status, transportation, housing. I had someone come up to me earlier and say, please talk about housing. Housing, or the lack of housing, or the lack of affordable housing. Access to services, discrimination, social and or environmental stressors. So when we're looking at health, it's really, really important to look at what what's happening around individuals, and the way to do that is to look at social determinants of health. What we know is that these things here listed impact health and public health. So what do we know so far? What does the research tell us so far about what we know about trans communities? And I call it transgender identified and or gender non-conforming individuals. Those are two different things, but they often get lumped together. So I want to be clear that this is what we're talking about. What we know about the general life conditions of folks that identify within the category is that the studies suggest there's stigma, there's prejudice, there's violence, and there's institutional institutionalized dis, uh, discrimination. What do we know about health disparities? Well, some studies suggest psychological distress, suicidality, substance use and abuse, tobacco use, HIV and other STIs. Wow, I'm such a buzzkill. But the reason why I can only say studies suggest is because the way we collect information and the way we do research has been really lacking. And let me tell you why. It's because we haven't collected data in a comprehensive way that includes gender identity as a measure. Okay, so many of you will know there's a difference between sex and gender. Sex refers to biological differences. Gender refers to cultural meanings that are associated or that are connected to certain uh, identities, right? So we know the difference. Those of us in the room understand that. We know that there are folks that identify as having gender minority status. And we know that we've made some efforts in the United States to have folks self-identify whether or not they are identified with a gender minority status. And now, as a result of some of the work my colleagues have done, we actually have tested questions, questions that we have put through a, a research process where we've had focus groups put together to really ask, is this a good way of asking gender identity status? And we have those now. So we know how to ask this question. So what's the issue? It's getting everyone else on board, right? So it's, 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 and let me tell you that it's happening at a faster speed than we all imagined, right? If you look at marriage equality, which is a big issue for, for the, some of the research our institute does, um, you know, it's moving at a faster clip than we expected. So we are working with the federal government and the state government and private entities that are conducting a lot of these surveys and saying, test this out. Put gender identity on your surveys, okay? And so one of the big things that we were able to accomplish is having the, the CHIST survey, which is the California Health um, Interview Survey, add that measure, which is gonna be a really big, big plus for California. And the reason why it's big, big plus is because we're gonna get a large enough sample and a random sample that tells us we can turn around to the world with that data and say, this is true because we talk to as many people as we could, and based on the numbers, we have enough people telling us X, Y, or Z. So we're very, very excited about that. But that's an area of, of great need, and so that's something researchers have been working on. So what is this useful framework I'm talking about? Well, I'm talking about something that uh, those in the public health world would know, the socio-ecological model, okay? And this model is looking at different levels in which things are happening. I say things because it's a little bit easier to understand. So we know that gender and the way gender is shaped, and um, I am pulling directly from my colleagues' work, so this is not my work, so I'm paraphrasing, but we know the way that gender works is it, it's really a, a, a process in flux. We know that it happens at multiple levels. We know that it depends a lot on your history. It depends a lot on your culture. And we know that it changes over time. No one person identifies as one singular thing. I, well, I sh let me take that back. That's making an assumption, so I'm calling myself out on that. 
But not everybody identifies as one thing at one point in time that stays consistent for the rest of their life, right? So knowing that, we have to look at all the different levels in which things are happening. We've got the individual level, the interpersonal level, community level, we've got the, and then we've got kind of the larger scope. And so I'm coming to you as an attorney, I'm coming to you as a researcher to kind of stretch your mind today, to think about your work in the context of all these different levels in which things are happening. So for those of you that experienced burnout, as I did when, when, once when I was a direct service provider, I'm, I'm giving you a tool today to take a step back. Think about this issue, this problem, this conflict that you might be dealing with at a direct service level in a different way. Think about the ways that you can impact change that takes a step back. And this kind of framework that really makes it clear to everyone where different things are, different things meaning we call them technically interventions, but where we can operate, the systems within which, it, which we can operate that will make a change, that will make a difference all the way down to the individual level. Now, one reason why I have to work with that kind of framework is because I'm working on issues such as this. How many folks in the room are familiar with HIV criminalization? Okay, so that's a good chunk. So I did a talk here, same room, different meeting, um, where I talked about HIV criminalization. This is the use of laws uh, that provide for criminal penalties for people living with HIV that specifically target people living with HIV. We have those laws on the books here in California. So these laws, they're sometimes in the health and safety code, sometimes in the penal code. These laws are based on outdated and erroneous beliefs or understandings about HIV. Why do you say? Because these laws don't necessarily require transmission. In some cases, don't even require exposure to HIV. And yet, we still have them on the books. So these are laws that are used in addition to public health laws. So as you know, if you think of you know, what, what our media has sometimes painted as a monster, right? Somebody that's paused, that's running around trying to infect other people, um, that this kind of imagery that's used to demonize somebody, well, we have laws on the books, public health laws, that could help to mediate that situation, if we truly believe what the media has to say, which is always a big assumption. Um, but this is in addition to those public health laws. This is criminal laws. This is time, incarceration, probation. It, it's all of those things. So we have criminal laws, okay, that don't require transmission, sometimes don't require exposure even, and they result in harsher penalties for people living with HIV. What do you think is a harsher penalty? Well, we all have different feelings about this, but I think when you're being penalized under one of these codes for longer than someone that's killed another person, that's a problem. So there are some statutes, manslaughter, manslaughter is resulting in the death of another person, that call for time shorter than some of the codes that exist for HIV criminalization. So I don't know, raise your hand if you think that's a problem. Okay, thank you. At least I'm in the right room. <laughs> so here's, a, here's an example of one of those code sections. This is, um, this is the exposure law, if you will. And uh, in California, we have something known as a good-bad law. Uh, good-bad law, it's a bad law, but it's on the good side, I guess, if we put it on a spectrum, because it requires that you engage in unprotected activity, that you know you're positive, that you didn't disclose, and that you had specific intent to infect somebody else. Why would this be a good law? Well, it's good because if you use protection, you're good to go. If you bothered your, to get tested and you know your status, actually, that's a bad thing. So if you don't get tested, it's a good thing. How, how warped is that? Um, you could save yourself by disclosing to your partner that you're paused, because that's really easy to do, I've heard. And um, you could you know, lack specific intent, meaning that you didn't really mean to infect somebody else, but the issue with that is people think you have specific intent even when you didn't, right? So a lot of people think like, oh, well, you didn't tell them, so that means you intended to infect that person. Well, you know, those of us that are on the legal side of things, we would disagree, but I think even if you're not on the legal side of things, you disagree. So anyway, this is, this is one of those code sections. 
I'm saving you all from going to law school, just so you know. You get in that lesson right here. All right. So um, 647F is probably oh, the worst one of them. It's one of the ones that I, I really, really, really detest. Why? Well, I think that the trans community is particularly targeted. I think trans women are particularly targeted from this crime called solicitation. All right? We know, we know that there's something called walking while trans. It's a phenomenon that's been captured not only in your lives and experiences, but in research. We know that that happens. So this, this code section looks at people that have been criminalized prior with a solicitation charge. Now, what is a solicitation charge? Does it actually require that you engage in sexual contact? No. Can a conversation be charged as solicitation? Yes. Can HIV be transmitted through a conversation? Yeah, last time I checked, no. So, knowing that, what we know is that if a person gets stuck, stuck in the system, charged with solicitation, they can also be required to go and take an HIV test, court ordered. What happens after that? Say that test comes back positive, guess what? The next time you come in and you're charged with solicitation, i.e. walking, and you have a positive HIV test, you will be subjected to a sentence enhancement. Which means that not only are you charged with the solicitation, now it's a felony and you could go away for an additional 16 months, two years, or three years. That's a penalty enhancement. And when I say that it, the exposure doesn't even necessarily need to happen, this is what I'm talking about. So that's one area that I work in. And that's one area that kind of uh, is at the core of why I do the work that I do. Because all of you that are working really, really hard to help individual people come and get great services and making sure that those services are accessible and making sure that we're doing everything that we can through activism, through social work, that all of you are working in this system, but if you, if you had an opportunity to open your eyes and look a little broader, you are doing it on the backdrop of criminalization where knowing your status puts you at a unique risk of being criminalized. And that's not even beginning to mention the issues having to do with what it means to be a person of color and criminalized, or being, uh, I don't know, being uh, uh, homeless and criminalized, something really relevant right now here in Los Angeles. Or, or even having a history of incarceration and what that means to you and your future. Right, so, so that's, that's one of the pieces of work that we do. So then, in addition to that, we conducted a legal, legal needs assessment. Uh, I talked to quite a few people here in LA County looking at the legal needs of people living with HIV. I went to every APLA pantry in existence multiple times. I went to every Bienestar location throughout the county, and we conducted this research because we wanted to know if people living with HIV continue to have legal needs. Well, I, that sounds like really academic, and what, is, what the hell does that mean? It means, did you have a situation in your life where you could have been helped by an attorney? A big problem with that is, how do you even know you need to be helped by an attorney? Well, we ask questions that help people say, okay, so were you ever put out of your house? Did you ever um, have somebody tell you you had to leave? That's an example of, say, eviction. So we, we changed the terms a little to explain what that was. So we were trying to get at understanding what legal needs were, and we were able to reach a lot, uh, majority low-income folks, a, a significant group of trans women, so our sample size, 9% uh, were, were trans women, and significantly more black-identified women. And we went like I said, we went around the county to make sure that we had representation from all the different areas, particularly those four. And we found that 50% of our respondents made less than $10,000 a year. Sounds really low, right? But that's actually, that's SSI, right? That's disability. 78% under 20,000. And then 57% receive less than a high school diploma. So what were the legal needs that were identified? Well, you can see them right here. Healthcare access, 47%. We talked to almost 500 people. 
What does it mean when somebody said they had an issue with health care? It means that they didn't get the medical care that they needed sometime in the last year. They didn't get medication that they needed sometime in the last year. They didn't have health coverage sometime in the last year or didn't have it when they were being surveyed. In the time of ACA, what does that mean that you don't have health coverage? We cannot make assumptions about who has health coverage in this era. Now, many people think, oh, well, HIV, everybody knows about HIV. What are you talking about, stigma and discrimination? Um, Look, it's still an issue. And so our survey really made that real. Look at the numbers in the middle. That's the column for trans women in our study. The figures there are highest there, particularly in healthcare. So we have a lot of work ahead of us, right? One of the things that we found out is that um, you know, most of the people that have a legal issue, that, that experience some trouble, they never even look for legal help. Why? Because when you're in the midst of having issues that affect your income, your housing, your health care, do you have time to look for an attorney? No. So most people didn't look for an attorney. And guess what? Of all the people that had a legal issue in the last year, only 16% ever got legal legal assistance. So we know that there's an impact to not getting legal assistance. And why do you think I focus on legal assistance? Well, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm an attorney, so that's number one. But number two, we see legal services as being able to address problems with housing, income, healthcare access. And that's why we see it as a really critical, critical service. So um, I leave this slide up a little bit longer than the rest because The other thing that we really uh, were surprised by, not surprised by, um, that's technical speak, um, was data that we got about criminalization, was about victimization. And among trans women, we found that they were more vulnerable to violent attacks and significantly more likely to being violently attacked than straight cis men. So... I think everybody in the room understands the difference between trans and cis, but cis is the opposite of trans. So this was a figure that was really striking. The next one is that 41% of trans women were uh, reported an interaction with the criminal justice system, which is significantly higher than cis women. So what does that mean, Uh, being arrested, being detained, being charged, being held? So in addition to being more victimized, Trans women were also more likely to be criminalized. What does that say about our systems? So as I was saying, we see legal services as one way of addressing this disparity. We see it because it's a way to to address barriers, structural barriers, real barriers to living a good life, right? And, And we think that through providing that legal service, we're able to look at what are the bigger policy issues the issues that are affecting everybody here. And so I welcome you at this moment to really think about what it means to move forward from this space. So what are the strategies that you learned that can address health disparities for transgender identified and gender nonconforming individuals? What are those strategies you learned today? Then think about what are the ways in which your work, your work can begin to address those large barriers. It's an overwhelming feeling, but I welcome you to start a conversation and use the framework. If it's not the framework I provided, then another framework. But use a framework to help you think about this problem in a dynamic way. And last but not least, you know, what would it take to implement lasting change? So one of the things that we often see, um, even legal services world, is we have these great things called fellowships where we bring somebody in, and for a year right after they've graduated law school, they get to do work in the community. Guess what happens? The fellowship ends, and that person is gone. So I've heard capacity be something that everybody is raised here. That's an ongoing issue. What's the issue with capacity? We don't have enough money, right? So these fellowships, in in my world, as I think about legal services, fellowships are really great and really wonderful, and they allow us to build capacity, but that's not necessarily the lasting change we need. And so I, I, as I tell myself to do it as well, just so you know, um, I also encourage you to think about that. 
What does it mean to make lasting change? And what does it mean to make change that affects all the levels that we've talked about today? So interpersonal, um, organizational, community, and, and, and societal. And I, and I, uh, and I, last but not least, I, I, I want you to think about this, and I know the folks in this room are probably not the people I need to be talking to about this, but please, please, always think about who is missing from this conversation. Now, I'm really glad today this is a super diverse room in a lot of ways, um, but in a lot of conversations I engage in, particularly at the state level and the, and the national level, this is almost always a question. Who is missing from the room? And if you don't ask it, it'll never be addressed. Thank you.